Good morning, Liberty Church, and good morning to everybody who's watching this from all across UK and all across the world. I'm Pastor Mark Ritchie. I'm the pastor of Liberty Church in Swansea, and I'm giving you a great, great welcome to our service this morning. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what on earth is that on the side of his face? It's huge. I've been praying about this all the last few days and praying for the mountain to be removed, but it's still there. So I'm not going to go like that all day. Just try and ignore it. <laughs> Just joking. Today is the first week of October. Amazing. Can you believe it? It's less than 100 days to Christmas. It's 98 days to Christmas. And how many of you parents, you're under pressure. Your kids are saying things like, Dad, what a terrible year. It's been so hard this year. Oh, it'll be so nice to have a Christmas tree in November. How many, how many have got that pressure? I think we're going to do it. But you know, it's almost Christmas. It's October. It's the first week of October, which means that it's our missionary given week. So listen, we're going to have a great service today. Today we're going to have uh, Dave and the team lead us in worship. We've got a great kids time from Rachel. Uh, Bassam is going to give us a big five. Now I know you're thinking, he's old. Is that what you're thinking? That don't matter. We'll, we'll let him in. Bassam is going to bring a great uh, big five for us, which is going to be so, so good. Lucy is going to bring a Bible reading and also a little bit of a report on our first week at Bible school. Uh, and then and then we've got an amazing thing. My brother David is going to preach the word today. Uh, it's, it's going to, I'll tell you, we had a little bit of a sermon last week and so many people were so blessed that I've decided to do the whole sermon about scattering seeds, about living your life for God, about pouring out your life and, and words for people to, to hear God's word. And so that's going to be absolutely great. I guarantee it. I want to read something from Psalm 34. It's so, so good. It says this. A song by David, King David composed after he escaped from the king when he pre pretended to be insane. So it's not an easy time for David. This is what he says. Lord, I'm bursting with joy over what you've done for me. My lips are full of perpetual praise. I'm boasting of you and all your works. So let all who are discouraged take heart. Anybody out there discouraged? If you're discouraged this morning, take heart. Take heart in what David is saying. Join me, everyone. Let's praise the Lord together. Let's make him famous. Let's make his name glorious to all. Listen to my testimony. I cried to God in my distress and he answered me. And he freed me from all my fears. Gaze upon him. Join your life with his and joy will come. Your faces will, will glisten with glory. Yeah, man. You'll, you'll, you'll never wear that shame face again. When I had nothing, desperate and defeated, I cried out to the Lord and he heard me bringing his miracle deliverance when I needed it most. The angel of the Lord stooped down to listen as I prayed, encircling me, empowering me, showing me how to escape. Drink deeply of the pleasures of this God. Experience for yourself the joyous mercies he gives to all who turn to, to hide themselves from him. Worship in awe and wonder all you who be made holy. For all you who fear him will feast with plenty. Even the strong and the well and the healthy and the wealthy grow weak and hungry. But those who passionately pursue the Lord will never lack any good thing. Wow. This song talks about the goodness of God. We we are so blessed. We are so blessed this morning. All my life, even so, so good. With every breath that I'm able, I will sing of the goodness of God. And I just want to really encourage us this morning as we, as we listen to all the things that's going to happen. Determine in your heart that you're going, to, you're going to live in the goodness of God. But you're going to share the goodness of God too. That many, many people will put their trust in the Lord. And as you speak to them, as you share with them, as you pour your life into them, many, many people will, will, will give their life to Jesus and their lives and the lives of their family will be changed. So guys, you ready? Come on, let's worship, magnify the Lord with me. Over to you, Dave. Let's worship the Lord. Hungry, I come to you, for I know you 
Thank you so much worship team for that great time of worship. We are so blessed in Liberty Church uh, because we have people who know what it is to, to lead people into the presence of God. And one of the things I love, last Sunday when we went back into the church was having a time of worship together. Yeah, there were restrictions, but the presence and the power of God was there. And as we reached out to God, you know, with our hearts, he met us right there. And so thank you so much, Dave and the team, for that amazing time of worship. Now Rachel's going to come and do a, a kids' time. Kids' times are so good. We all love them. She's going to come and do a kids' time, and then Bassam's going to come and just share a few thoughts from his heart in the Big Five. So are you ready? Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Bassam. Let's prepare our hearts to hear from God. Over to you. Liberty Kids, I'm here in Silo Chapel again, and today I want to talk to you about your imagination. 
Who thinks they've got a great imagination? Yeah? We can do all sorts of things with our imagination. We can be a knight sword fighting. We could be a superhero saving the world. Or we could be a princess that rules over the kingdom. We can make up all sorts of games. Our imaginations are absolutely fantastic. We can write stories, maybe even we can make our own movies. How cool would that be? Well, our imagination is wonderful, but sometimes our imaginations change teams. Would you believe that? Who's ever had that happen to them? What could happen is we're walking along and you see a shadow and then all of a sudden, oh, our imagination thinks, oh, something's there, but it was just my shadow. Or we might hear the wind. Ooh. And we're like, oh. what's that? And all of a sudden, the amazing imagination that God gave us, it changes teams and it starts to think the worst. I remember when I was a little girl, we'd recently shifted house and we had this house that had lots and lots of land and in the backyard there were horses and in the front yard sometimes you'd see kangaroos jumping through and we had lots and lots of possums so anyone know what a possum is they hang by their tail and they're very cute well this one night i was laying in bed and i could hear breathing and it was like heavy breathing it was like I thought, I'm breathing quite funny, is that me? And I was trying to breathe. I don't know if that is me. And I thought, okay, I'll hold my breath and see if it's me. Hold my breath. <gasps> the breathing kept going. And I was like, oh, that's not me. That's something else. And my imagination changed teams and it started telling me that somebody was in my room and I started to panic. Now, I've got a question for you. We'll come back to that story. Who here loves light? I absolutely love lights. I love fairy lights. I love Christmas lights. We'll get to put them up soon, hooray! I love Christmas lights. I love city lights. I love Shanghai and Hong Kong and the cities that were just so full of lights. Oh, I love them. I love torch lights. Who likes reading with a torch or going around at night with their torch, yeah? I love God's lights, the stars that he put in the sky, the sun, the moon. I just love light. Well, light makes everything better. And you know, this night when I was laying there and I'd held my breath and I'd realized that this breathing wasn't me and I started to panic because my imagination was working for someone else totally and was thinking oh there's somebody here there's somebody here and I thought I need light I need the truth I need to turn on the light so I got my courage together and I ran over and I turned on the light and you know what I saw just outside my window there was a baby possum and it was really sick. And that's why it was breathing like that. It was just laying there, this poor little possum. <sighs> it kind of needed help really, didn't it? Um, but light changes everything. Light brings the truth, all right? But what we've got to know is our imaginations, while they are absolutely amazing and God gave them to us, sometimes they change teams and they work against us. They start telling us that things are bad. They start telling us that we're bad. They start telling us that people don't like us. They start thinking that maybe we can't do things and that's just not true. Now there's a verse in the Bible and it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse five. And it says, casting down imaginations. All right, casting down means like, oh, throw it, like casting down oh, imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the word of God. You see, God's word, that's the truth. 
And if something comes in, some sort of imagination comes in that's different to God's word, we need to bring the light and we need to like throw these imaginations down. This is cast them down. Makes me think of like when somebody's running at you and you grab them, it's just bam, and you throw them to the ground or you throw them on the couch. Have you ever played that with your brothers and sisters? Yeah, it's probably not very safe. Don't do it. But our imaginations, they tell us all sorts of things. They tell us when someone's in our room, when really, turn on the light, truth comes. And it's like we've got to throw that imagination away and bring the truth. Our imagination might tell us things like, well, you're always naughty. Rachel, you're always naughty. You're just going to be naughty forever. You can't even behave. You're a naughty girl. My imagination might tell us that everyone's going to laugh at me. I shouldn't even try things because people will laugh. It might tell me that I'm never going to have any friends, that people don't like me. But from that, that Bible verse, we need to realize that it's our job to take those thoughts, to take that imagination and say, no, that's not what God says about me. That is not the truth at all. I've got to like turn the light on and the light says that I'm loved. The light says that I'm like my father and he's good. So that means I'm not going to be naughty all the time. We need to bring the light of God's word. And when we do that, it's like we take that imagination and we slam it down on the couch and say, no, God's word says something different. There was a story in the Bible about the children of Israel, and they were about to go into the promised land. But before they did, they sent in some spies. And two of the spies, they looked around, they saw the grapes, they saw the fruit, they saw the land, and they came back saying, this is amazing. But then the rest of the spies, they looked around and their imagination started to see things. They saw how big the people were. They were like giants. And then they started to imagine themselves. I've never done this. Who's ever imagined themselves as a grasshopper? They imagined themselves as grasshoppers. They said, we're just like grasshoppers in their sight. Oh my goodness, what a funny imagination. But you know, if we listen to our imaginations, we get talked out of all the things that God wants to do in our life. Well, the children of Israel, these spies that came back, they said, oh, it does look good, but the men, they're so big and we're just like grasshoppers in their sight. We can't do it. We can't go in. And they listened to their imagination where they had the whole God of heaven, God of everything on their side. And they could have listened to him and they could have gone in and taken the land. But instead, they had to walk around in the wilderness for 40 years. I think they should never have listened to their imagination, don't you? Well, you know what? We've got the same choice. When your imagination comes and it starts playing for the wrong team and it starts telling you that you're not good enough or that somebody's out to get you or that you're always bad, that God could never forgive you, you need to tell your imagination, no, and like, like run and turn on the light switch. The light switch of God's word that says, that's not true about me. I'm gonna take this imagination, I'm gonna slam it down, I'm gonna cast it down, and I'm gonna agree with God's word. Because God's word, he says that you're amazing. His word says that you're an overcomer. You can overcome all things. His word says that you are made in the image of God, which means that you are good. His word says that you are strong, strong in the Lord. He made you strong. He gave you his joy, which is your strength. His word says so many cool things about you. And when we turn on that light and we say, mm, this is the truth. That's who I am. Imagination, hit the couch. God made me awesome. So kids, that's my challenge to you this week. Stay awesome. Let your imagination run wild for Jesus. But if it changes teams, you take that imagination and you cast it down. You say, no way. You're not having any place in my life. Jesus has a great plan for me. All right, kids, have a great week. We love you. Bye.
morning. Good morning. Here is another big five. Well, I'm coming today. I have two gifts. Anyone love gifts? Yeah, I have I have here two gifts. Uh, one which is, uh, oh, I, th I think it's, it's not wrapped well. It's in a gift bag, but it's, it's not really wrapped well. But I have another gift here. Oh my goodness. Look, look at this gift bag. It has a badge on my name. It has a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Look at the back. And also inside there is, there is a gift inside. Look at it. So, well, let me just start by opening this gift. Mm. Which one shall I start with? You know, this is, looks good. Let me just keep it till the end. And let me start by this one. Well, let's see what's here inside. Mmm, cufflinks. There is another thing. There is a card. What is, what's written in this card? Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow, look at this. It has a love gift of money. Oh, a lot of money. 100 pounds. Wow. 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 If this is the, the, the one with, with, which looks little bit less than the other one has all of this, how the other one looks like. Look at this. Look at this. This is looks... Man, this is, looks really good. Let's just open it together. Anyone is excited? Let's just open it together. Oh my goodness. What is this? What the heck? Look what is in this bag. Rubbish. Rubbish. Oh. Oh, oh, look at this. Oh, ah. make my head dirty. Sorry, guys, I have to stop here. I must go wash my hands, especially these days. Oh, excuse you. Let me just go wash my hands. I apologize, guys. I had to go wash my hands, even use hand sanitizer, especially these days, and make my hands smell and looks good. But you know what? I, I wanted to make this illustration. Many years back, I, I, I showed this to my son and I said to him, son, listen, I want to teach you something. Sin is a package. You either take it all with all the dirty, unclean, smelly part of it and you cannot turn away from it. And you cannot like take the wonderful, amazing package outside, the wonderful and the good part of it and leave the bad part of it. You know what, guys? This is what the world is offering us. There are genuine gifts and there are fake gifts. When I was young, um, in, in, in my work and even in school, people were, were just like looking down at me. They are, because I have, I have parents who will ask me like, where, where have you been? Where are you going? And I used like to look at other colleagues and friends and see, oh, they, no one is asking them where they are going, what they are doing. They party a lot. They go to bad places. And I used to look at the freedom they have. And I feel jealous. Oh, I don't have their freedoms. But you know what, guys? Days pass by. And when I look at these people, some of them, they died. Yeah, serious. In a very, very, very young age, they died. They are finished now. They are no more. Others, they fall into huge big trouble and this is the subject i want to talk to you about you know the bible says something which is really amazing it says in book of proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 it says the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom do you want to be wise fear god fear god and then he says whoever in proverbs fourteen twenty six says whoever fears the lord has a secure fortress and for their children, it will be a refugees. And you know what, guys? The biggest, the biggest disease is, is not the COVID-19. It's not cancer. The biggest disease, I believe, is sin. And the Bible says in Romans 7, verse 13, it says that this sin is so sinful. But also the Bible says that 
the, the, the wages of sin, this is written in Romans 6, 23, wages of sin is death. Any wise people now want to choose death? Please don't choose this. Only wise people choose to live with God. If you want to be wise, choose to live for God. This is the complete and the perfect wisdom. So, Mr. Perfect came today. Basim is coming today to tell us like, yeah, you should not do anything. I'll tell you, no, come on. This is not what I'm saying. I'm not interested to say I'm Mr. Perfect. In fact, no. But I want to teach you something. If you fall into sin, run quickly, run so very much fast to God and ask for the blood of Jesus to come and wash you. You know, I can walk uh, uh, outside and, and get sweat. I can work in the garden and get sweat. I can, and then all of a sudden I'll start to be, I will smell bad. It's, it's, I'm smelling, you know, it's nothing but stupidity to remain like this. Wisdom is just go take a shower. And you know, this is written in the Bible. First John chapter one, verse nine, 10 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just will forgive us, will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Guys, no one is perfect. But you know what? There is the perfect blood of Jesus, best detergent ever, ever, which can cleanse you and me from sin. Last thing I want to finish with is, you know what? Don't be religious. There is so much fun in the real relationship with God. When I met with Jesus and he became my friend, you know what? I, I never look at these friends. He was like to invite me to parties. You invite me to bad places. I never felt jealous of what they're, they're, they're doing in, in their places and their parties. You know why, guys? Because there are so much fun in the church. There are so much fun with the Holy Spirit. And you know what? I invite you. Come to church. Our church, Liberty Church. You know, when you come to the church, it is so much fun. Shall I give you an evidence? Yeah. You know, before this time of lockdown, the meeting used to be finished, I think, 12, 31. You find people still in the church till 2, 30. Yes. You know what? Good gifts. Horrible gifts. Which one you will choose today? I advise you, choose the right and the genuine one. Ask God. Tell him, Lord, I want you to be so real. I, I sat with God before and I said to him, you know what? I found that reading the Bible is boring for me. I don't like reading the Bible. Holy Spirit, I sat with the author and I said, Holy Spirit, would you do me a favor? Make it, make it attractive to me. And you know, when I sat with the author, when I said, once I, said, I prayed this prayer, oh, the whole Bible started to test different. Come and taste the Lord is good. You have a good day. You have a good day. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you so much, Bassam. You are the coolest Egyptian that I know. Walk like an Egyptian. All right. So good. Are you enjoying the service so far? Trust that you are. Got a few little announcements uh, to give you. Um, first of all, again, thank you so much to all those who continue to give faithfully to Liberty Church and to the Lord. We are just so blessed and uh, we just thank the Lord for, for your generosity and for your commitment to, to him and to his kingdom. And we just pray that God will bless you. Uh, and today is the first Sunday of the month. So usually in, 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 in the church, we take up an offering for our missionaries. Um, our missionaries are doing a fantastic job in, in Swaziland and Cambodia um, and also in, in the Philippines. And uh, even though there's a pandemic, we still need to support them. So if you, if you could, if you want to give a little bit extra, put it in our bank account, put it under missions, and we will make sure that they get uh, the, the, the money that they need to support them every single month. So thank you for that. And thank you for those who give faithfully. Uh, this afternoon at four o'clock, we are going to have um, our second uh, service together since the, since the lockdown. Last week was brilliant. Oh, 
People came with a sense of anticipation and excitement and enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart. And we came against fear in the name of Jesus. It was just great to see everybody again. We're all wearing our masks and we're all, you know, finding it a little bit different. But like I said last week, the Lord was there. His presence was there as we worshipped him, as we heard God's word, as we prayed, you know, for each other. The Lord and the presence of the Holy Spirit was there. And so four o'clock um, every Sunday, we're going to have our service. Now, if somebody, some people are saying, why do we do it at four o'clock? Why can't we just go back to 1030 like we did before? Don't worry. Nothing is in cement. But this is what we felt from the Holy Spirit for the last six months or seven months our, our normal has become online service on a Sunday morning and I know that so many of our own people are watching this and so many people that actually can't come to church because they're shielded or they're, or they're elderly or, or, or for whatever reasons they can't come they've been enjoying you know our services and uh, it's, it's been so good and so uh, what we decided to do instead of moving that to the afternoon and then start a new church service in the morning again we don't know what's ahead you know, within a month, the church could be locked down. We actually don't know. So we just thought, why don't we keep the 1030 online service that everybody can watch and we don't have to change it. And we'll add a service at four o'clock for those who really want to come and be together and to worship the Lord. It's just the same service, but different, different ways of doing it. And so whatever happens, even if there's another lockdown, we will keep our 1030 services for the time being. Uh, and we're four o'clock. Maybe we'll add another service. We're not 100 percent sure. But we know that by doing that, many people will be blessed in the morning and also in the afternoon. But like I said, it we're just month by month. We're just seeking the Holy Spirit and we're saying, God, what do you want us to do? So that's why we don't move it back and switch it around. There's so many things uh, unstable right now. We want to keep that morning service online, afternoon service, yeah, you know, for, for face to face. And then if we need to adjust, we can do it. We're free. Praise the Lord. So four o'clock today, we're going to have our service at Silo Chapel. Um, I just want to really encourage us. Um, last week, last few weeks, God's been really impressed upon my heart about the importance of B groups in this season. The importance of being part of a small group. Now, maybe you want to say, I don't want to do that. I want to keep myself to myself. And, and that's okay. No, nobody can force anybody. But I'm telling you right now, there's storms coming and there are times coming where maybe we won't be able to meet. We don't even know. Even about Sundays in the, in the, in the days ahead with all these spikes and second spikes, etc. And we just feel it's really, really important that if you're going to grow and if you're going to come through this, it's important that you have a small group of people that's encouraging you, that's blessing you, that's praying for you, and also that you can pray for them. And, you know, I, I'm going to just testify that, that in, my, in my B group here in, in, that Mary and Debs run, it's absolutely brilliant. Wherever you're going through, there's people there that genuinely love you and care for you. And we're not in each other's pockets all the time. Just a little WhatsApp message. Pray for me. Boom, it's there. And Wednesday nights were on Zoom. And it's quite easy. It's just absolutely great. And so if you want to become part of a B group, please let me know. Let us know so that we can start a few new groups and that you can be included. So please, please let me know. I feel, you know, the, the strength of the early church was small groups. It was house churches like I said last week and I believe that that the strength of our churches in the coming weeks and months apart from prayer it's going to be the strength of small groups so give me your name and let's get some small groups started up so that whatever happens we're there join me after the service for zoom it's going to be absolutely great and absolutely brilliant so um over to you Lucy Lucy's going to tell us about um what's his, what our first week at Bible college She's going to read God's word. We're going to hear one more song and then straight in to my brother David. My brother David's got an amazing message for you. He's a, a minister over in Warfield, uh, over in Bracknell, uh, beside London. And uh, he's doing a great job over there. And I heard this message. And last week, Dave was talking about scattering seeds. And this message is all about scattering seeds and the seeds that you scatter into people's lives. Who knows? Who knows what's going to come of it? So Lucy, Dave... And David, I know you're thinking, once you see David, you'll realize that I got the, I got the big portion of good looks. I know. Please, please say amen. Anyway, just joking. Over to you, Lucy. Let's go. I'll see you at the end of the service. Hey, everyone at Liberty Church. It's Lucy here. I'm at uni in London. Um, and 
Mark has just asked me to pop on to say hello and also to update you on how it's going. Um, I'm settling in really well, which is honestly a relief. Um, and I'm making friends and, well, making friends, but we're all friendly. <laughs> it's nice. Um, and I'm also getting to know the structure and sort of routine of uni life. I haven't started my lectures yet, um, as it's been fresh this week this week, so we've had a lot of um, inductions and uh, meetings about different things, but also it's been quite fun as well. We had an open mic the other night, which was very fun to partake in. Um, but other than that, on the sort of more serious front in terms of academia or um, stuff to do with my course, I found out my placement church, which will be an Anglican church in Watford, which will be a very new experience for me. Um, but I'm really open to it and really looking forward to seeing how God moves and how he uses me and how he also uses other people to change me during that time. Um, I've also found out who my first study tutor is, and that is Geraldine Luce, more formally known as Geraldine Latty. For those of you who don't know what a first study tutor is, it basically means that I'm having singing lessons um, from Geraldine, uh, which is insane um, to be saying that out loud. <laughs> um, it's very exciting, and I'm just so looking forward to growing and just seeing God move. Um, on, on the subject of growing, Mark has asked me to read a passage from Mark 4, verses 26 to 29, and it's the parable of the seed growing. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises day and night, and the seed sprouts and grows he knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe at once, he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Yeah. Father, I thank you that during the season you are planting seeds. Seeds that will not be uprooted, seeds that cannot be uprooted, Lord. Father, we thank you for your continuous presence as we plough through this time, Lord, that is so unknown. Through this time of uncertainty, God, we trust you. We say we trust you, Lord, and we thank you for all that you are doing, all that you are doing in us and through us. We thank you for the growth. We thank you for the stretching, for the refining, Lord. We praise you, Father, for your perfect will. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I come to you, let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I found in you.
Great to see you all. So for those who don't know you, know me, my name is David and I'm one of the associate ministers here at Warfield. And it's great to be able to uh, share God's word with you, which is actually going to be in person, which makes a change of just talking to a camera. And so this is feeling very different for me. But it's great to be here. And so we began a series on the kingdom of God and it, our title is On Earth As In Heaven. And in the worship and word service, which has just happened, we're going to be looking at different parts of the kingdom of God. And in the communion services, we're going to be looking at the different parables. And today, we've got the parable of the growing seed. And when I read it, Mark 4, 26 to 29, there's not masses in there. And I'm thinking, what am I going to share? How can I get something from this parable of growing seed? And as I began to pray about it, I began to actually think of some of the things that have happened in my life that I want to be able to share with you today. You know, when I was 22 years of age, 1996, I probably shouldn't have said that, because now you're all trying to work out. I'm 46, right, before MD tries to work it out. Oh, a year before you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Catherine always wants to tell me that she's younger than me, right? But... Well, looks different. Yeah, anyway, right. So anyway, right. So 22 years of age in 1996, along with some other people in a small place called Fraserburgh, which you may have heard of if you're watching some documentaries about some murder things that have happened. But anyway, right, in a place called Fraserburgh, there, there, we started this thing called Powerhouse Kids Club, which was a club to reach out to children in our town. And we saw many children and young people. Actually, we saw hundreds of kids come every Friday night to our kids' club. And they would come through our program, and at the age of 15, 16, 17, that sort of age, 14 sort of thing, they would start to drift off. And I got so devastated. I'd spent my life teaching these people about Jesus, teaching these children, telling them the Bible stories, watching them grow in their faith, and then when they reached an age where they were tempted by other stuff, they just wandered off. And it broke my heart. And God knew that it broke my heart. He knew how devastated I was. And then one day, one of our leaders came and she began to tell me the story. She said, David, you know that I'm a teaching assistant at one of the local schools, the secondary school. I said, yeah, I know that. She says, well, you never, um, you can, you'll never believe what happened this week. I said, well, what happened? Come and tell me what happened. She says, I got the, the, the worst job of all jobs. I ended up in charge of running the detention for all the kids who misbehaved that day. And she said, I got into the detention and I looked up and I saw all these kids coming. I thought, oh, I know them. I know them. Yeah, that Colin Date, I know him. Yeah, he's here all the time, right? Janet Moller, yeah, she's a nightmare. Anyway, and so, and so I got all these kids in and I knew them and we all knew who they were. And then this one 15-year-old girl stands up and she says, I know you. You're that leader from that kids club that I used to go to, that Bible basher. She says, oh... My heart just sank, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, get me out of here, get me out of here. She says, and then the girl began to say, I remember some of the songs that we used to sing at that kids club. She says, and the, the, my friend's telling me this, she says, ah, oh, my heart sunk even more, right? And then she began to sing this song, and it's called Light of the World. And she began to sing this song, and in this song it says, here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. And she says, my, my friend told me, as she sang it, something powerful happened. But then she sat down and she started misbehaving again. But something inside me came a light when I heard that story. You see, it broke my heart that these young people would just wander off and turn their back on God. But something of a seed 
had been planted in the her. And something of a seed had been planted in that 15-year-old girl. Something of a seed had been planted in the hundreds of kids that had come through our program. That maybe in a month's time, maybe in a year's time, maybe even 15 years later as we stand here today, maybe something will still birth in her at a time in her life when she's not expecting it, that will begin a journey of faith. You know, I got a picture at that moment that my job is simply just to scatter seed, to spread God's word, to teach people about Jesus, to share my faith with others. And allow that seed to take root in their lives. Whether I see the fruit or not. Our Bible reading today said, he also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts and grows. Though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. A few years back, my dad sent me an article of a magazine that he'd been reading. It's of a group called the Faith Mission, a great Christian organization. And in the center of this article, in, in the center of this magazine was an article of one of the Faith Mission workers who was telling her story. And in the story that she told, I couldn't believe it. Because she told of a story of how she grew up in this place in the middle of nowhere called Fraserburgh. And she'd gone to this club called Powerhouse Kids Club. And every day, every Friday that she went, every Friday night, she would hear these stories about Jesus and totally ignored it. But at a later stage in her life, she'd come to found faith. And this seed that had been planted began to grow you know my job and my heart is to simply scatter seed whether I see the fruit whether I reap the harvest or not I wonder where you are in your faith today you know this story this parable that Jesus told it says it says uh, all by itself the soil produces grain first the stalk then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it. You know, I don't think salvation is necessarily just something that just happens when something happens to the seed in the soil, but I think salvation is a growing thing. I think salvation is a process, not just an event. And I wonder where you are as you sit here today or as you are online. I wonder where you are in your faith, in this formation of faith. You know, there are different stages. It's first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. And as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it. Maybe you've just started out on this journey of faith. Maybe you've came here for a different reason. You're not even on a journey of faith. It's great to have you here and on here. But God wants to do something in you and grow a faith in you and a trust in him. And you might be here because you just want to come or you want to come at a nice building, beautiful building that this is. But God's brought you here today and God's brought you online today or whenever you watch this and catch up because he's got a plan and a purpose for your life. Faith is not a process. Faith is a process, not just an event. And sometimes I believe I'm not going to see the full reap, the full fruit of the labors that I have labored. But who knows? What has gone on with the seed that I have sown? I'm going to finish by telling you a story. It's quite a lengthy story, so bear with me. Some of you have maybe heard this before. I'm just going to read it word for word rather than try and summarize it. This is not my story. This is somebody who's recorded this and found out this happened and has written it down. True story. Are you ready for this? 
I was never great at reading in school. I always used to uh, pretend I was sick when I had to do this in English. But anyway, right, I'm going to do it anyway. And hopefully you're understanding the Scottish anyway. Here we go, right. A number of years ago, during a testimony night in a Baptist church in Crystal Palace in southern London, a stranger stood up in the back, raised his hand and said, excuse me, pastor, can I share a little testimony? The pastor looked at his watch and said, you've got three minutes. And this man proceeded. He said, I just moved into this area. I used to live in another part of London. I came from Sydney in Australia. And just a few months back, I was visiting some relatives and I was walking down George Street. You know where George Street is in Sydney. It runs from the business hub out to the rocks of the colonial area. And he said, a strange little white haired man stepped out of a shop doorway put a pamphlet in my hand and said, excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you died tonight, are you going to heaven? He said, I was astounded by those words. Nobody had ever told me that. I thanked him courteously and all the way back to Heathrow, that puzzled me. I called a friend who lived in the new area where I'm living now and thank God he was a Christian. He led me to Christ and I'm a Christian and I want to fellowship here. The Baptists love that sort of testimonies. And everybody applauded and welcomed him into the fellowship. The same pastor flew out to Adelaide in Australia the next week. And 10 days later, in the middle of a three-day series in a Baptist church in Adelaide, a woman came to him for counseling. And he wanted to find out about her Christian journey. And he said, I used to live in... Oh, no. She said, sorry. She said... Oh. And she said, sorry, I thought it was he. And she said, I used to live in Sydney, sorry. And just a couple of months back, I was visiting friends in Sydney, doing some last minute shopping down George Street. And a strange little white haired man, elderly man, stepped out of a shop doorway, offered me a pamphlet and said, excuse me, ma'am, are you saved? If you died tonight, are you going to heaven? She said, I was disturbed by those words. When I got back to Adelaide, I knew this Baptist church was on the next block from me. And so I sought out the pastor and he led me to Christ. So sir, I'm telling you that I am a Christian. Now this London pastor was now very puzzled. Twice within a fortnight, he had the same testimony. He then flew to, 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 uh, he then flew to preach in the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Perth. And when his teaching series was over, the senior elder of the church took him out for a meal. And he said, mate, how did you get saved? He said, I grew up in this church from the age of 15 through Boys Brigade. Never made a commitment to Jesus, just hopped on the bandwagon like everybody else. And because of my business ability, grew up to a place of influence. I was on a business out in Sydney just three years ago and a white haired man stepped out a cheap a shop doorway, offered me a religious pamphlet, cheap junk, and accosted me with a question, excuse me sir, are you saved? If you died tonight, are you going to heaven? He said, I tried to tell him I was a Baptist elder. He wouldn't listen to me. He said, I was seething with anger all the way home to Perth. He said, I told my pastor thinking he would sympathize with me. And my pastor agreed. He had been disturbed for years knowing that I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And he was right. And my pastor led me to Jesus just three years ago. Now this London preacher <laughs> flew back to the UK and was speaking at the Keswick Convention in the Lake District. And he, and he threw in these three testimonies. Listen to this. At the close of his teaching session, four elderly pastors came up and said, we got saved between 25 and 35 uh, years ago in George Street. Through this little man on George Street giving us a tract and asking us that question. He then flew the following week to a similar Keswick convention in the Caribbean. That sounds amazing, by the way. Right, <laughs> to missionaries. And he shared the testimonies. At the close of the teaching session, three missionaries came up and said, can you believe this? Three missionaries came up and said, we got saved between 15 and 25 years ago, respectively, through that little man's testimony and asking us that same question on George Street in Sydney. 
Coming back to London, the pastor stopped outside Atlanta. He's got an amazing ministry, this pastor, isn't he? True story. He stopped outside Atlanta, Georgia, to speak at the Naval Chaplains Convention. And when his three days of revving these Navy chaplains up, over a, over a thousand of them, and soul winning, the chaplain general took him out for a meal and he said, how did you become a Christian? You know where this is going, don't you? Right. He said, well, it was miraculous. I was a rating on a United States battleship, and I lived a crazy life. We were doing exercises in the South Pacific, and we docked in Sydney Harbor for refreshments. We hit King's Cross with a vengeance. I got blind drunk. I got on the wrong bus and got off on George Street. As I got off the bus, I thought it was a ghost. This elderly, white-haired man jumped in front of me, pushed a pamphlet in my hands and said, Sailor, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to heaven? He said, the fear of God hit me immediately. I was shocked sober and ran back to the battleship. I sought out the chaplain. The chaplain led me to Christ, and I soon began to prepare for the ministry under his guidance. And here I am, in charge of over a thousand Navy chaplains, and we are bent on soul winning today. The London preacher, six months later, told you his long story. The London preacher, six months later, flew to do a convention for 5,000 Indian missionaries in a remote corner of northeastern India. And at the end, the Indian missionary in charge, a humble little man, took him home to his humble little home for a simple meal. And he said, how did you, as a Hindu, come to Christ? He said, I was in a very privileged position. I worked for the Indian diplomatic mission and I traveled the world. And I am so glad for the forgiveness of Christ and his blood covering my sin because I'd be very embarrassed if people found out what I got into. He said, one bout of diplomatic service took me to Sydney. And I was doing some last minute shopping, laden with parcels of toys and clothing for my children, walking down George Street. And this courteous little white haired man stepped out in front of me, offered me a pamphlet and said, excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you died tonight, are you going to heaven? He said, I thanked him very much, but this disturbed me. I got back to my town. I sought out the Hindu priest, and he couldn't help me. But he gave me some advice. He said, just to satisfy your curious mind, nothing else, go and talk to the missionary in the mission house at the end of the road. And that was fateful advice. Because that day the missionary led me to Christ. I quit Hinduism immediately, and then began to study for the ministry. I left the diplomatic service and here I am by God's grace in charge of all these missionaries and we're winning hundreds of thousands of people to Christ. Eight months later, the Crystal Palace Baptist minister was ministering in Sydney and he said to the Baptist minister, do you know a little white man, an elderly little man who witnesses and hands out tracts on George Street and he said, I do. His name is Frank Genor. But I don't think he does it anymore. He's too frail and elderly. The man said, I want to meet him. Two nights later, they went around to this little apartment, knocked on the door, and this tiny, frail little man opened the door. He sat them down and made them some tea, and he was so frail that he was slopping tea into the saucer as he shook. And as he sat with them, this London preacher told him all these accounts over the previous three years. This little man with tears running down his face began to tell his story. He said, my story goes like this. I was a rating on an Australian warship and I lived a rep, 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 reprobate life. And in a crisis, I really hit the wall. And one of my colleagues who I gave literal hell was there to help me. He led me to Jesus and changed. And the change in my life was night to day. In 24 hours, and I was so grateful to God, I promised God that I would share Jesus in a simple witness with at least 10 people every day. As God gave me strength. Sometimes I was ill. I couldn't 
go out. But I made up for it the other days. I wasn't paranoid about it, but I have done this for over 40 years. And in my retirement years, the best place was in George Street. There were hundreds of people. I got lots of rejections, but a lot of people courteously took the tracks. And he said, in 40 years of doing this, I've never heard of one single person coming to Jesus until today. Mr. Genner died two weeks later. You know, sometimes we will never see the fruit of what we do in this life. But each and every one of us as followers of Jesus, if we are a follower of Jesus today, each and every one of us is called to share our faith, to reach out to other people. And you may see the results in this lifetime, or you may never see the results in, life, in this lifetime. And you may be here today and you're saying, well, I'm not a follower of Jesus. And if that's you today, either in here or on there, if that's you today, I want to say this to you. The exact same words. Are you saved? If you died tonight, would you go to heaven? Jesus stands here today. And because of Jesus' death on the cross, there's a way to a relationship with the Father. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus came to make a way to the Father, to fix the wrong that had been done in the Garden of Eden, to fix all the, the bad stuff in this, in this world. So I ask us today, are you saved? If you died tonight, would you go to heaven? You know, yesterday, we went to see my daughter. She's uh, studying in Oxford Brooks up in Oxford, obviously. And uh, she's kind of forgotten us since she went up there. And we went there, and uh, my, my driving in cities isn't great, okay? My driving anywhere is not that great. But my driving in cities, right? I'm from a small town where there's hardly any traffic lights, right? Driving through these cities is not great, right? I've already had two bus lane fines in Redden, but anyway, right? right? Go to Oxford, and Elizabeth saved me. My wife saved me. She says, you're about to go. Why does Satan have to take you down a bus lane? Right? Anyway, right? You're about to go down a bus lane. And we turned this corner. And I couldn't believe it. I'd just been telling Elizabeth about this story. This story is actually in YouTube, and so I've had to repeat it because we don't have the facility to, to show that. And so I was driving down, and we turned this corner, and I'd just been telling Elizabeth this story, and there's a massive sign. It says, George Street closed. God works in funny ways. George Street closed. And as I began to think and pray into that last night and this morning, I wonder if there's people watching here today. People maybe even here today. And you remember a time when you was like this guy, so on fire, giving out, telling people about Jesus, but for whatever reason, your jaw street is closed. You stopped sharing your faith. Believe it today. God wants to open up jaw street again for you. So let's just pray. If you're watching online, if you're in here today, and these words have spoken to you, are you saved? If you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? And you realize you can't answer that question. I'll give you an opportunity now to come to faith by saying, praying a simple prayer, an invitation prayer to, to God to come into your life. So if that's you right now, just repeat this prayer after me. Dear Lord, I just invite you into my life now. Come and forgive me of all the rubbish. Come and help me to live for you. Come and show me the things you want to show me. 
and come and bring transformation, I pray. Maybe there are others watching today. Something of today's message is spoken to you and you want to be able to freely be able to share God's word. Share your story. Maybe your jaw street is closed or maybe you just lack confidence. I'm going to pray for you now. And if that's you, either watching online or just sitting here, just hold out your hands in front of you. And I'm going to pray for God to give you boldness. Give you the right words to speak. And so God, I pray for all of those that are holding out their hands now, either here or online. God, I pray you give each and every one of us, me included, boldness to speak your word, to be able to share to be able to share my faith and their faith with others. Help us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Catherine. How many are challenged by that word? How many are challenged to sow seed into people's lives? How many people are challenged that even a small word, a small piece of encouragement, even a question, can you imagine if, if we could take up the challenge, not of speaking to 10 people a day, but how about 10 people a week? How about if we ask 10 people a week, if you died today, do you know you're going to go to heaven? If we could do that, I'm telling you, our Alpha course would be starting up again because so many people would be coming to Jesus because people don't know how to answer that question. And when we tell them that we have the answer and his name is Jesus, would you like to receive this free gift? Wow, it's amazing. So I'm challenging you and I'm challenging me. 10 people a week, ask them, ask them. Do they know the Lord? Do they know if they die today, would they go to heaven? David, thank you so much for that word. I pray that each one of us will scatter seeds wherever we go and bring the life of Christ wherever we go. What a great service we've had today. We've really enjoyed the service. We've been really challenged by the service, by everything that everybody said and sung. And I don't, don't know about you, but you know, I just, I just want to make my life count for Jesus Christ. Today, at the end of the service, we are going to play a beautiful song by Sound of Wales. We love Sound of Wales. We love Kath and the team there. And it's a song called It Is Well With My Soul. It's an old hymn. And, and I just feel it's significant. I don't know why the last few weeks and months I've, I've, I've felt this song is significant. When peace like a river attendeth my ways, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot you've taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. And as we listen to this song, I want to ask you, is it well with your soul? At, at, during this song, if it's not well with your soul, just get down on your knees and say, God, I just want to give you my heart. I give you my life. I want to come back to you. And I want to be someone that lives for you and that can tr tr truly say, it is well with my soul. I'll see you at Zoom after the service. I pray you've had a great, great uh, service today and God's spoken to you and challenged you. And I just pray that as you listen to this song, you can really, really say, it is well with my soul. To those who are coming to the to the face-to-face the, the -face meeting in Silo Chapel in a few hours, I'll see you there. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart. Enter his courts with praise. And let's all say together, it is well with my soul.
Shit. 